fictitious people. They count the degree that one. That yeah, they count the chief, the the top one, the chief yeah. accountant maybe. Yeah. Should have them. Other financial director. Yeah, financial director. Okay, do you want to see what they actually came up with? So if you go to page eleven, sorry, page eleven, sorry, it's obviously the next page in yours. The top half of that is in these as well. Right? Yeah, in the top part you can get rid get rid of, yeah. Okay, so weaknesses and improvements. There are two wages clerks dealing with production payroll. Would be useful if their duties could be rotated during the year, would neither of them responsible for all functions of the department at the same time, and it would help to reduce error, deliberate or otherwise. Okay, personnel records should be kept for each employee giving details of appointment, retirement, dismissals, resignation, rate of pay, holiday, with a specimen signature and photograph. It does not appear that such records are maintained at the moment. Such records will be sent in the event of the computer system failing. They are also useful in confirming the existence of employees and showing that starters and leavers have been properly dealt with on the payroll. And if you want to there for yourself, it's actually compulsory now to actually by the revenue to have a wages file on site, an actual, you know, either on the computer or a manual hard copy one. And they can actually come around and look for all those details for you. It came out by there. A couple of months back. And what is it you look for? All the details of every employee in the business. Yeah. And you like you're supposed to keep like say if someone started and someone finished, you have their copy of the P forty five come in, you have a copy of their P sixty, you have a copy of the P forty five when they actually leave. You've all their all their details, everything is like the file with their photograph then as well. In fact if you look up online, it's actually a um, a new brief came out there, I think it's May or June of 14 it actually came out, but about being compulsory to have it. The production manager verbally, verbally notifies the wage department of new employees. He also controls unissued clock cards and pays out the wages. He can introduce fake employees and pocket their wages. There should be written authorization from the chief accountant of all new employees. He should also have custody of all unused clock cards. Ideally, someone other than the production manager should be involved in the, in the distribution of the clock cards. The, the wages clerks amends pay rates and other standing data with no authorization. They can invent new employees or falsely alter pay rates. All changes standing data should be made by a more senior official and the data should be password protected. On a regular basis, a record of all amendments to standing data should be printed out and reviewed. The clocking in and clocking out process should be supervised by a senior official to prevent employees clocking in for each other, which does happen now and then. Mm -hmm. The manager pays out wages alone. It should be preferable if at least two people pay out the wages. A random surprise hint that a payout would, should be made by one of the directors. Unclaimed wages should be recorded in a register and held in the company safe until they are claimed. After the period, any unclaimed amount should be investigated and rebanked if necessary. Like, who's not going to turn up and um, collect your wages? And, like, that's be like making the wages go through the bank. The wages don't you know, have to worry about yeah. having unclaimed amounts. The payroll should be signed off by the person preparing it. The director should check that it has been signed before signing the wages checks. The assistant accountant should carry out random checks on individuals on the payroll, agreeing pay rates, starters, and levers, etc. All computerised data should be regularly backed up with the backup data stored off site. It aims to draw a large amount of cash and keep this on site. If possible, the company should try to convince its employees to receive their wages by bank transfer. Think about like you have 120 staff and you have cash in the office on a Thursday or Friday for 120 staff. There are weaknesses in the monthly payroll. The assistant accountant should sign the payroll as a preparer and the director should authorise the bank transfer only after agreeing that the payroll has been signed. Salary increases should be notified in writing by the chief accountant after authorisation by the director and personnel records should be kept as far as for production staff and appointments and the missiles should be authorised by directors only. I think that, that's it. And there's only one more, so I have. Can I give you that one? No, I actually have it here. Any overtime worked should be authorised in advance by the department manager and reviewed afterwards. So any overtime worked <coughs> should be authorised in advance 
by the department manager and reviewed afterwards. Why don't you like that? But it's it actually common sense. Do you know I mean? Sometimes, like, it's even, do you know what I mean? Just to put down the, you might think they're not right, but to put down the, the common sense ones, even about, you know, backing up the data to a, an off site location. And that question, like, is asking you about the weaknesses in the payroll system, okay? That's one way the question can come up. Then they can ask you to actually do what we we'll look at next week, the internal control. So you are looking at the internal controls and you're actually. Um, walking down through the internal controls and it can come up as a substantive testing as well and I want just to keep those three things separately so that when you look at the questions you're either looking for, you're giving the weaknesses in the system, you're setting up an internal control questionnaire to, look, to see how you actually audit internal controls and substantive testing as well, so there's three different ways they can actually come up um, to see June 10, November 10 to see, I know there's another payroll question on one of them. We actually think we would have even made sure before. Yeah, it's actually June 10. And it's question 3. Yeah, they'll all be the same. And we use nearly the same things for 
So you do everything across the board, then after that. You could have a rotating structure. Yeah, yeah, that someone would come in while the wages are being done, like the director of the company would go in, or whoever is up higher in the, the chain of of the finance. You really have to know why they're doing because you could look at the system. On the system, yeah, yeah. And like, you, you do a spot check on the, well, like, they they would even have to know what you're checking. Because you could actually just point to the system itself, yeah. yeah. Then draft in detail four tests of control, do you want to take as part of the audit of the wages system? And include the proposed sample sizes. We're talking about 3,000 employees. Okay, so they, they usually start with maybe 5% uh, or 10%, and if you find mistakes in them, you work it up and take another bigger sample. Like if you're looking at the internal control, you take certain things, <coughs> you say, we're going to look at 5% of the wages. Okay? And we're, if we go through it and we discover there are a load of mistakes in the internal controls and in the wages. You actually have to up your sample size and actually do more. But the percentage kind of go down the more there is, like a few 3,000, you're not going to go checking 300. Oh yeah, no, you, you have to bring it down. Yeah, they couldn't like, well, or what's 5% five, five would be 150. Yeah, like, that's even a lot. Yeah, even even 1%. 1%, 30, 1%, 30, 1%, 30, 1 is it? 30, 30, yeah. So say start with 1% and work up. Like, so like, three, like, whereas if you were doing 300 employees, you could probably do maybe 50 of them, no bother, like, which would be a, a higher, higher percentage. But hopefully in the 30 you do, you don't find a lot of um, mistakes. So four tests of control, do you want to take as part of the odd the wages system? A sample of 30 employees would be selected and for one week in the year, a test of control will be undertaken to determine if the control to ensure that employees were only paid for hours worked operated effectively. So you just take 30 employees, get out all the job cards, get out all their wages, tax deduction cards, and check that everything is matching up across the board. That can be very divorced. So imagine going through that and all you're doing is cross checking and, yeah. and, and ticking. A sample of 30 amendments made during the year to payroll standing staff will be selected and test control will be undertaken to determine if the amendments were correctly authorised. So say 30 amendments made, so someone's rate went from 14 euro to 16 euro, who authorised that? Okay, and you should have a, you should have a letter with Could a signature the of, sorry? Could it be the hours varied. The hours varied, yeah. But it's, it's the same here, more standing data, so like, say you agreed there's an hourly shift rate of 14 euro and someone's shift rate was actually more than 14 euro and why was it put up to 14 euro and someone actually authorised that so you should have like a letter then inside in the file with some signature in it with letters inside the file there's no signature that means the internal control hasn't worked do you know what I mean? you can put the letter in there but it's that the manager hasn't signed off on it a sample of 30 wage payments during the year that would be selected and test of control will be undertaken to determine if the payment was correctly authorised in accordance with the bank mandate approved by the board of directors. A sample of 30 wage payments would be selected and a test of control will be undertaken to ensure that the control in place to ensure employees are paid at the correct rate of pay operated effectively. That, that's something like the one above and it's, they're, very, they're actually very similar. And <coughs> When we're doing it, we have to, um, <coughs> I've seen in, like, they, they've done just like this in this exam, right? This is going back to 2010. But in the newer exams, go up to 13 and 14, they actually want you to know the working paper. So you actually have to have a working paper to know and giving your your control while you're testing it, the objective of it, and then what happened when you actually tested it. They're actually looking for more information. It's like usually like the exam done, they're actually increasing in um, difficulty. Okay, and outline the impact of the results of the above test, both positive and negative, would have on the audit strategy you would adopt in the audit of wages. So when the results of the above test are controlled are positive, this will allow the audit to place reliance on the controls in place in the wages systems. Consequently, control risk will be judged as low, and this will allow the audit to accept a higher degree of detection risk, but yet achieve the desired level of audit risk. Therefore, reduction in the level of standard testing required by the auditor is likely to be achieved. The opposite would also apply where the test of controls indicated that the controls were not operating effectively. Control risk would then be assessed as high and a lower level of detection risk would be required to be achieved. This would be achieved by increasing the amount of standard testing 
undertaking. And I know that's like a lot of internal control extensive testing, but that will make more sense now the next week we have all of them, because I have a lot of little charts to make that easier to actually understand. To see like, the difference between <coughs> that question in, in August 2004 to 14, which was like purely, you know, just listing off the weaknesses, whereas this one actually doing the internal controls part of it yourself. And you could be, instead of asking for the internal controls, you could be asked for the substantive test you'd actually perform. Okay? So there's three different ways, and that applies for sales, purchases, fixed assets, inventory, your bank, your um, bed debts, the whole, all the cycles across the board, you can be asked the you question and those. All the same way, didn't you? Sorry? You can only answer all in the same way, just. Yeah, just different between change rounds, yeah. Yeah, but just know there's it can be the weakness of the system, it can be the internal controls, and it can be the substantive testing they can actually aim for the three different ones. Okay? So what I'm going to do is just to break up from doing wages, okay, and go back to that in the next slide with the internal control questionnaire. I want to give you some more notes on risk, because I see looking at the exam papers, risk nearly comes up in every whole exam paper. They love putting in the risk or the odd risk. Control risk, inherent risk, and the um, section risk. And for, so for the guys who weren't here the last night, I gave the little thing to actually, the little man with the umbrella, to actually better understand risk. Do you, you Gillian and Cynthia, you remember the. Yeah. Yeah. But when you look at the thing, it actually will make it easier. What I said was. Let's go to this in a minute. Well, I can actually photocopy it. Well, I, well, I, it's I in pencil, pencil though, so might be. See how you is yours in pencil? Just in terms of in spiral. It's not, but yours is really neat. I thought that's fine. Right, I can make the. No problem. I can make it bigger. What I had was that um, it was like um, this is an umbrella here, yeah, right? If you want to photocopy, it might be. And this is just I photocopy the brain <laughs> there and just give you an idea. This is me. <coughs> this is me, the auditor in here, okay? And it's raining up on top here. So on top here, the rain is my inherent risk. Okay, so my inherent risk is outside my control. Okay, it's the rain coming down on top of me. Okay, my umbrella is my control risk. Okay, so my umbrella has all the internal controls inside here. And then this is me inside here, okay? And I'm trying to set my odd risk, which will be looking at my detection, D, T, C, T, risk. Okay, so all these little raindrops here are my inherent risk. And it just holds in my umbrella, okay? All these risks are coming through my control risk, so I can place reliance on my control risk. So I'm going to have to do more detection risk. Whereas if there's very little holes in my umbrella, the rain can't come down to it. So my inherent risk will be low, my control risk will be low, and my detection risk will be higher. We will actually see from the night I did it, it actually helps think about you can't control inherent risk, you can't control control risk, that's dealing with the, that's dealing with the umbrella and the rain, but you can't control detection risk. Because if it's raining like the one soon, okay, the auditor, all this rain is coming down into him and he's put on this big overcoat, so he needs to have more detection risk done. Whereas if it's only a little soft shower and there's hardly any there's he can place um he can use these two here, then he's doing less detection risk and he has a little like a little coat on him. It's just trying to think of a different way for thinking about all the different risks. But I, I, I thought about that and I, I gave more notes, it's only a very simplified version of it now. It's on the video, yeah. It's on the video as well, yeah. So I just want to give you some more notes on that because I said they've given the theory on, on risk all the time. And did I give you notes on the risk that night? I did, yeah. There's actually a lot of notes on risk that night. Yeah. 
as in hand writing with hand writing. Yeah, yeah. You did, yeah. I use four different boxes in in turn risk control, risk <coughs> detection, risk handling. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually photocopied them off of you there and did it at the break. It's just because my USB this this um USB this malfunctioned and uh, I had no backup done. So um I had lost all my notes that I had on it. Oh, All the notes you gave us from the start. From the start. Did you want to copy them? There's no problem. No, so I actually have them all here. Yeah. Handy, they, just, they were handy, do you know what I'm saying? Once they said, I could actually just you know, um, email them out. Which I can't do anything about it now. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, so what company it means with all these little cross in it, these are all the misstatements inside in their accounts. And for company B, he's only got five misstatements inside of these accounts. <coughs> and what this is called, this is called the basic workings of the order of risk model. You've got high inherent risk and high control risk, it increases the risk of material misstatement. Okay, so it increases the risk of material misstatement. are poor internal controls. And 
and they may give an example of um, a high risk with inherent risk company. Think of an insurance company. Okay, so in an insurance company, okay, you have all these estimates to do. Okay, so if there is um, claims and stuff, and there's a lot involved in judgments and estimates and, do you know what I mean, um, during the year. Whereas think of uh, someone, a company who just collects rent. All they do is collect rent during the year. There's nothing about estimates or judgments, just collect the rent and that is, that's it. Whereas a high risk for insurance, you actually have a lot of risk involved there, haven't you? So high inherent risk, increase the risk material in the statement, okay? So what's low inherent and control risk? It decreases the risk of material in the statement. So which the question is, so our question here, okay, we've got a question, which company will require more audit reference in the statements in the account. Or it's in the account, in the financial statements. Sounds better. risk, high control risk, so that means you're going to have low detection risk. Okay, and low detection risk means more work for the author. Why is there no detection risk? Because you're seeing your, your inherent risk is high, your control risk is high, so your detection risk has to be low then. Think of your farm, I think of all the risk is 100%, okay? So your inherent risk is 60%, your control risk is 10, 30%, so your detection risk would have to be 10%, so you have to do a load of more work to actually fight to keep detection risk low. So low detection risk means Lower chance of detection. No, it's, it's a higher chance of finding the mistake because you're doing more work. Because there's lower, it actually works the opposite way. Mm. Lower detection risk means you're doing more work. Higher detection risk, yeah. you're doing less work. Is that because then there's not good enough controls? Yeah, the control, control, the inherent control and the, con, the internal controls are not good. So inherent is like it's a, a risky business. And then control is because the internal control is the company has itself. You know, like the, the guy with the umbrella, the umbrella is full of holes so and, all, and there's inherent risk is outside. It's generally, generally risky business. A risky business. Not just yeah. itself, the actual industry. industry. The actual industry itself, yeah. So think of like the, the, the insurance business. And I actually have another, I actually, I'm going to go through inherent risk there tonight as well. I have an example of a technology company. Do you mean the technology company at these days has to change so fast? Do you mean there's a lot of risk? You could actually make something and actually your competitor has something else. Do you know what I mean? A couple of months before you, and that's do you know I mean inherent? They are you cannot actually do anything about that. So inherent is outside of the auditor's control. Control risk outside the auditor's control because the company so makes the internal controls. controls. 
the only thing he can actually have control over is detection risk. So he has a low detection risk, so he'll have to do more hard work to find all these misstatements in company A. And then over here then, if we've low inherent risk, low control risk, so it's not a risk as a, as a risky business, their internal controls are very strong, so that means we will have high detection risk, which means less work for the auditor. risk Joe, you think it's like you know you've less chance of finding these but it's a higher chance so low detection risk means high probability to do more work with a high probability of detecting material misstatements strong internal controls, don't just say, oh, they're strong internal controls, and when I look at them at all, you always still examine the internal controls, and we'll do that now on the next slide as well. So if you combine that with the notes from the last, and I'll, I'll photocop the gigant so you'll have them, it hopefully it'll make the, the three types of risk easier to understand, because like, it comes up in the exam all the time, and like, if you, even if you could use they ask you to explain the three types of risks, okay, you have a definition for them. But even if you gave this, it shows you understand how the risks work with each other. <coughs> Do a little example. So it's good to remember the diagram. Sorry? Just remember the diagram. Remember the diagram, yeah. Yeah. I think high inherent risk and control risk, you have low detection risk. Low inherent and control risk, you have higher detection risk. I'm going to give you some notes now, just on inherent risk itself. Okay, so if you were assessing inherent risk, Assessing inherent risk. I did this off the board, yeah? The diagram, yeah. Okay, so all risk is 
control risk by inherent risk by detection risk. Okay, and requires the most professional judgment. Okay, so it requires professional. The most professional judgment. Okay, so we're looking at the nature of the cloud's business and okay, the, the more susceptible Okay, and here we're going to think about technology, the, the technology market. Okay, so the technology business. Exactly. Yeah, think of Apple. Joe Samsung, those. It always has to be improving. to remain competitive. And product life cycles are very short. on the nature of business. Okay, our next one, number two, 
see the nature of data processing. Managed and maintained greater than current risk. Three would be the complexity of the business, and number four would be inattentive management. to be management integrity. And this affects policy selections, earning based bonuses, bonus plans, tax minimization schemes. Are the, is, is he in business just to get much money out of the company he can himself? Or is he in business just to, you know, to create a good business? So that's the direct one. That's the direct, yeah. Results in previous audits. Is there not in fact going to? Yeah, there's another bit onto it, yeah. in previous audits. 
points still appear each year. Okay, the management are slow to make changes. What will happen is you do the audit, you find these weaknesses in the system, and the client, the management, are supposed to change these weaknesses. When you come on to the next audit, you're not finding the same things over and over again. familiarity with the client and their business. Okay, new engagement is more risky. Up a little bit. Okay, our ninth one is related party transactions. Okay, <coughs> and related party transactions, they're difficult to evaluate. and the director in the company or someone management in the company owns the building and they're renting it to the to the company are they doing the rent do you know I mean are they actually paying themselves more are they paying themselves the old rate more than likely they're aging towards paying themselves more than if they had someone in renting it aren't they mm -hmm. and this is all like the inherent risk like, you have no control over this, you can't make a director bring him and advise him, but I'm not going to listen to you. Uh, number 10, we have non-routine transactions. There's high judgment involved. Pay for allowances, provisions, etc. Insurance client couldn't just where there's a high risk of, you know, once I 
here. For inherent risk, and just to have fun and open it, the inherent risk is not static. So, it's static the audit, okay, we, we have a 100% audit risk, right? And say we set our inherent risk is high and it's 50%. Okay, but during the, we're actually doing our audit, we find something that actually might increase our, our inherent risk or might actually reduce our inherent risk. So, that's what I mean, inherent risk is not static. Okay, it's assessed the planning stage. Push. But review during the audit. If new information. It's not just, do you know I mean, it's not just cutting, just setting stone at the start of the audit. When you set it at your planning stage, and if your inherent risk is going to be, it might change during the time. Okay, so that's our inherent risk. So, do you want to break there for 10 minutes before we go on to the next part?